Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm excited to announce my new product, My Slippers. They took me over two years to develop because I didn't want just an ordinary slipper. My Slippers are meant to be worn all day long, no matter what you're doing, whether you're inside or outside. My Slippers come with an exclusive three-tier cushioning system that you won't find in any other slipper. It combines two layers of foam, including my proprietary My Pillow foam and a patented impact gel made from U.S. soybeans. My three-tier cushioning system is going to help relieve pressure points, provide that micro support you need for all day comfort and help prevent fatigue. Not only that, my slippers are made with high quality leather and a premium indoor outdoor sole that make them extremely durable. I personally guarantee they're going to be the most comfortable slippers you'll ever own. Go to MyPillow.com and click on the Radio Listener's Special Square and use promo code KEEPTHEFAITH or call 800-422-5310. You'll also get deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets, the MyPillow mattress topper, and the MyPillow towels. Go to MyPillow.com and don't forget the promo code KEEPTHEFAITH. Everything for everybody seems so overwhelming. You would turn on the news and see how many more thousand people had been infected or had died. Hear terrible stories about families losing multiple people within days of each other. The stock markets um, were just bleeding points. People were losing their jobs. There was just so much pain and so much fear. And I realized, huh, I actually am taking comfort in so many things that are not um, strictly the Lord. And I do think obviously he allows us to enjoy creation and he provides for us. But I found that a lot of my stability and security was sort of in day-to-day things that aren't the Lord and that were um, out of control for me. And it, and it made me root back to the one thing that is certain and sure and unchanging, which is God and his word and his promises. Shannon Bream of Fox News Channel is my guest today on CIA, Contagious Influencers of America. From the producers of Keep the Faith, I'm David Sams. We're going to get to Shannon in just a minute. I can't wait to do that. But first, I've got to tell you something miraculous has happened in my very house over the past few weeks. It's concerning my cat, Cash. You know, he's named after Johnny, of course. But he has just fallen in love with his uh, with his pillow from my pillow. You know, Mike Lindell put together this this special edition of my pillow for pets, and I can't get cash off of that thing. And you know, I, I have these uh, white couches. They've got those really uh, poofy, you know, pillows, and uh, um, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where he likes to get up on the, the couch and snuggle into him. And, of course, he's a Maine Coon, so uh, he kind of sheds all over the place. But since I put down the my pillow, pet pillow, from Mike Lindell in front of the fireplace, he's no longer getting up on the cushions and the, the, the pillows, the, the white cushions and pillows on the couch. He's going to the, the, the pet pillow from my pillow. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is saving me so much time of having to get that lint brush out there and work on it every time I have company over. And, of course, I have recording artists here all the time, and I have authors here all the time, and I have the who's who of Nashville that comes over and records with me at the homestead. And I'm always having to get that lint brush out and, you know, brush brush down everything and, and try to get all that that cat hair off. And, of course, some people are allergic to cats. So, you know, I really have to do this. I get the Lysol out and I do the uh, the lint brush. And by golly, since I put down that that, that my pillow pet pillow, uh, I, I've not had that problem. So I, I had to just share that story with you. It's it's quite miraculous. Check it out, MyPillow.com. Uh, make sure you use the promo code Keep the Faith for a very special discount. That's mypillow.com with the promo code Keep the Faith. Or, of course, you can call 1 800 422 5310. That's 800 422 5310. And, of course, uh, you know, these products come with a, uh, a 10 year warranty and uh, a 60 day money back guarantee. And everything's made in the USA. So you're going to be real, real happy with uh, with the discounts you get from uh, our special arrangement, our special deal between uh, us and, uh, you know, here at uh, Contagious Influencers and, of course, uh, Keep the Faith Radio. 
and Mike Lindell and MyPillow.com. So please do that. Hey, Shannon Bream joins me today. You know, Shannon is uh, just so incredibly talented, so lovely. So uh, she was great to talk with. She, of course, is an anchor on Fox News Channel. And uh, she does the uh, Fox News at night with Shannon Bream. Uh, she's also the author of a bestseller th- that uh, came out some time ago called uh, Finding the Bright. She is chief legal correspondent for the network and host of Living with Bream, a Fox News radio podcast. And she's anchored all kinds of things on Fox, and she's going to talk a little bit about that. But she's also going to talk about her brand new book. And that's really why I invited her on here. Uh, she has a new book out now called, um, let's get my memory. It's, it's uh, the, women, the, uh, the Women of the Bible Speak. That's what it is. It's, it's full of wisdom of 16 women and their lessons for today. And it is really cool. It's the women of the Bible who've lived timeless stories. You know, Shannon really examines them and um, talks to us about what it means to be a woman of faith. And these are just some amazing, amazing stories that uh, I can't wait for her to share with you. So let's get right to my interview that I just did with uh, Shannon Bream of Fox News. Hello, Shannon. Hi, David. How are you? I could not be better. Excellent. (laughs) Great to hear. Where are you based, by the way? I am just outside of Nashville in Franklin, Tennessee. I love it. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people love it now because we have all these people <laughs> moving here from New York, California. I, I, I actually, uh, gosh, I can't blame them. Oh, but you got to, you got to, you got to win them over to the Southern way of life. Yeah, and hopefully they won't bring their politics. But other than that, <laughs> I, I won't get into that. But you know, we we hardly have any houses here now. I mean, they're all mm-hmm. in the in the last six months. We've had this. Uh, this uh, crazy, I mean, it's like I know of 12 different people who have moved here from California. Wow. And I went into a, uh, a house showing uh, on Thursday. Now, mind you, the weather it was a little rainy. It was a little chilly. It was a Thursday afternoon. And I walked into uh, a, a subdivision that was, you know, really 15 minutes out of the way. But in Williamson County, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh. You would have thought it was Sunday afternoon at two oh, o'clock wow. and it was 75 degrees and sunny. There was a couple there from New York, one from California, another from Pennsylvania, and then some folks from out of the country with a Ooh. bunch of kids running around. Two of them were ready to make cash offers. Oh, wow. That's the thing, too. When you start competing with cash offers, it's hard for regular people to get a house. I, I, and I guess they have all this money. You know, I came here. What? Uh, let me see. This is uh I came here 11 years ago from California. I was in the TV Mm -hmm. business out there, and I I moved here. And, of course, back then it was just a little town, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? Little one-horse town. Oh, a little one-horse town. And I remember they were giving away places downtown because they could not get anybody to move to downtown Nashville. Right. And now it's so super cool. It is Broadway off and the, the charts. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your thing because uh, I, I know uh, time is tight here and I really appreciate you taking some time with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And we're going to talk about your new book here in a minute. But uh, let's just talk a little bit about you first. We've never really had a chance to sit down and talk. And I'd like for you to tell me, first of all, where you come from, what your roots are, and why you are who you are today. Hmm. Well, I'm born and raised in Florida. I'm a seventh generation Floridian. There are not very many of us, but my dad was super proud of that. And just our our deep roots and our long legacy there. Um, He has passed away now, but I would say he and my mom obviously are the biggest shaping factors on who I am. And I'd give my edge to the mom uh, because we are sort of like, I'm her mini me. Um, I want to be more like her when I grow up. She's such a, a faithful person, a prayer warrior. If you ever have something you need, give it to Marie. She's going to be there interceding for you faithfully. Um, I grew up uh, in South Florida. We moved to Tallahassee where my family is now. So I call that the Southern part of the state, which it is. Um, And from there, I went on to Liberty University and I couldn't be more grateful for that experience on so many levels, just 
help me to grow spiritually, ask tough questions about my faith, about God in a good place where I could get answers. And um, the doubts were not seen as a sinful, bad thing, but just part of the growth process. And I think at you know, many times and in, in phases in our life, in our faith journey, we may have questions. And I think um, God's cool with that. He knows we're human beings and our, our brains are finite with what they can digest. Um, but from Liberty, I, if they'd had a law school, then I think I would have stayed. I loved my time there so much, but I went back home to Florida state uh-huh. to law school. And um, that was a great experience for me and uh, went on to practice law Never loved it. It was a great career, but I always had this pull into journalism. So I started at the bottom, uh, working overnights, making coffee and answering phones and left my law firm to do that. And it's been a roller coaster ride, but I couldn't be more grateful for where I've ended up. Absolutely. Now let's get back to your mom a minute because I heard you say how important and, uh, she has been and, 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 and what an influence she has been. But I want you just to share with me one lesson that your mom taught you that has stuck with you. And every time uh, you get in some kind of a predicament, you lean on that. She always taught me not to go with the crowd, to not cave to that kind of pressure, uh, to follow God's standards and his rules. Um, And it won't make you the most popular person. You're not going to ever be the coolest person, but you're going to be walking with one person who loves you more than anything else in this world has sacrificed everything for you and is in the process of redeeming you. Um, And it may not always be pleasant and easy, um, but that's what spiritual growth is about. So she just, you know, I can remember even as a kid, um, you know, we'd see people who were messing around at the mall, underage smoking or drinking or whatever was happening. And my mom would say, is that the path you want to be on? And it's a lot to ask, you know, like a seven-year-old. But um, she just always encouraged me to um, just believe in myself, believe in my worth as the daughter of the king, and to operate from that space and not from chasing after the world's approval. So you've written this book, uh, The Women of the Bible Speak, The Wisdom, uh, Wisdom of 16 Women and Their Lessons for Today. I, I want to segue into that, uh, coming out of your, your, your thoughts about your mom. Let, let's talk a little bit about this book why it was important for you to write, and um, what you saw in your mom's story and in your story when you put these words down on paper. Yeah, I think because I had the blessing of growing up in a Christian home, going to Christian school, university, I'd heard a lot of these stories, but then you have conversations with people and realize they don't know about them, or they think uh, they're intimidated by the Bible, or think it's a dusty old rule book full of stories just about men. But then you see these women whose lives were so rich and so important. They're included in the Old and the New Testament woven through with important lessons for all of us. And um, God valued women. He values them as um, created in his image. They're never secondary to men. Um, These are two equal halves of the same whole. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a honking horn. I don't know if you want me to start over. No, no, that's good. Just keep going. That's good. Yeah. So I'm just blown away that there are so many of these amazing stories tucked into the Bible, Old and New Testament, that people don't know. And I thought, gosh, what a gift and an opportunity to be able to dig into these stories. I thought I knew them. I learned a ton more about these women. I found so much encouragement. And listen, we include all kinds of people because I wanted the ones who were faithful from the beginning uh, and people that are just well-respected and showed great devotion, like Mary, the mother of Jesus. Most people will know her story, but we wanted to include flawed women too. I mean, we've got a prostitute, we've got a murderer in here. We've got a woman who pretends to be a prostitute to entrap her father-in-law. I mean, these are flawed creatures. We're all flawed creatures. And so I wanted to include those and to show where women who um, got off track, made their own plan, deviated from what God had planned. He still was redeeming that and working through that when they came back to him. And he made beautiful things out of the messes of their lives, which he does with all of us. Um, I'd see my mom and so many of these women who were faithful from the beginning. I think about Hannah who prayed and prayed and prayed um, for a child. She wanted a child and said, I will commit this child back to you. And that's who Samuel ended up being. But there were years of waiting and of heartbreak there. I think of my mom in that way and that she is so faithful and like everyone has experienced um, highs and real lows in life, physical challenges and other things, but she's just a faithful prayer warrior. So I would see 
Hannah and my mom. Um, for me, I, I gosh, I I think that I aspire to many of these women. I love Deborah and that she was a judge. So, um, like my background, she was um, solving legal disputes and solving problems for the people of Israel. But she was a leader. And when God asked her to do something that seemed impossible by the world standard, she didn't hesitate. So I would hope that I would grow to a place in faith uh, that I would be like Deborah when that moment comes. Well, that's good. And I, uh, by the way, you mentioned the audio. Uh, you, you know, we all have uh, home studios here, right? We're, I mean, that's we're Nashville. the way it works these days. No, I and mean, we're Nashville. We've always had home studios. And uh, so uh, on, on my end, when I do these uh, recordings, sometimes we have to work around uh, the uh, yard mowing. And the um, oh, <laughs> dogs barking, dogs barking, yard mowing. But our I, puppies on lockdown. I have to tell you, I I have to give you the award for I think uh, the best uh, uh, Zoom video that I've had all year. I mean, uh, uh, audio, <laughs> uh, Zoom audio. Oh, I'm, good, seriously, good, good, good. it's great. So <laughs> excellent. Well, I'm using this. Um, we've done enough of this now that um, our techie people at Fox are like, "This is what you need to use. It's very simple, but it seems to be the most clear." So I'm glad it's working. Well, I want to know your secret. That sounds great. Yeah. Hey, so let's talk about your story as it relates to this book, and you know some of the challenges that you have personally gone through. And what you've learned from some of these individual stories, how they have possibly helped you get through some of the things that you've gone through in your life. Um, you've been fired before from work. Mm-hmm. And I mean, a lot of people are right now, they've maybe they haven't been fired, but they've been laid off. Or they've lost their jobs. So what difference does it make, right? I mean, you're still wondering how you're going to pay the bill. They're bills. still wondering how to pay the bill. So let, let's use that as an example because there's a lot of people listening right now who are thinking, oh my gosh, my job doesn't exist. My industry doesn't exist. Um, I don't know how I'm going to keep it going. Yeah, it's exceptionally hard for a lot of folks right now, economically, financially, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, You know, I I lost my first TV job and it was a humbling, uh, painful experience. Um, You know, that first boss who gave me a chance on air left the station. His replacement said, you're the worst person I've ever seen on TV. And I don't know why anyone thought it was a good idea to put you on. Um, you're never going to make it in this business. And I was unemployed for months. It was really difficult. And it shakes your confidence and you're worried about the financial as well. So you feel like you have um, anxiety and stress on multiple fronts. And so many people are living through that right now as companies try to do their best to survive and keep as many employees as they can and bring back as they can. I learned a lot of humility through that Um, just because I knew things were out of my control and I had to trust that God had a plan, which I can see now in retrospect, a lot of it. Um, It's difficult when you're in the middle of that, when you're in the middle of that crisis or that valley, really, really tough. Um, But I think that writing the book last year during the pandemic gave me a lot of good perspective about um, just finding encouragement and inspiration in the word and in so many of these women's stories and lives. I think about Mary Magdalene. We write about her in the um, New Testament section of the book. I talk about how she so loved Jesus and she was so devastated as so many of his followers were, um, you know, following his crucifixion and had gone over with the women um, to do what they could at the tomb to take care of his body and to anoint it. And for her to get there and find that he was gone was just absolutely overwhelming and devastating for her. And so I think of um, her as an example of where you are sometimes in the very worst moments. She was crying so much that when Jesus was there, she assumed he was a gardener or someone else there and just asked, where have you put him? All I want to know, know is where his body is. But when he said her name, he said, Mary, she immediately recognized him for who he was. And I felt such inspiration and encouragement that in that, in the way that Jesus talked to so many of these different women very personally with terms of endearment, using their name or the word daughter. And I feel like he's calling to us that way now in our darkest moments and our best moments. Um, he doesn't change. So many of these stories are just universal and they, they span time and space that we all are going to have struggles. And I found so many of these women in the book, God was there for them in the moment he reached out to them. He called them by name. And I feel like he is still doing that for us today in a very different way, but that he knows every single one of our concerns. He knows what we're struggling with and he knows how to supply our needs. And it's 
a lot of times not the way that we think would be best or that we want it to happen, but he's faithful. What can we learn from uh, the these women about, um, let, let's talk about specifically overcoming the odds. Mm-hmm. With Deborah, she's such a great example because the Israelites were being oppressed by the Canaanites. They were in a terrible place when we get to Deborah's story. Um, you know, part of it, we read that the highways and byways were so dangerous that the uh, Israelites didn't even use them. Um, there was crime along the way. They were oppressed and they were struggling and they cried out to God as they did many times. We see this cycle where they would fall away from him and then beg him for help and salvation. And he showed up in Deborah. So we see early on that he tells her, um, get the men together and, and go take on the Canaanites. Now, to understand this time, and I had great theologians and biblical scholars that I called on every time I had a question uh, for the book who helped me out, um, to understand what was going on at that time, that the Israelites were very nomadic people. They didn't have um, the steel or the gold or the things in quantity that somebody like the Canaanites, a, a group like that would have. They had 900 chariots, we're told. Um, so the Israelites had none of that. She called in her leader, military leader, Barak, and said, okay, God says we're going to do this. And he says, uh, I'll do it if you go with me. He knows that she's anointed. And she says, because of your hesitation, um, we're going to fight this battle. But ultimately, the, the opposing leader, Sisera, the general of the opposing army, is going to be delivered into the hands of a woman. And in the book, we spell out exactly how that happens. That prophecy comes true. But what else comes true is that Israel overcomes what would be, to the human eye, insurmountable odds. In fact, they, the Lord sends such rains that all those fancy chariots they have, they got stuck. Their wheels couldn't operate in the mud. Um, everything that the world would tell you you need for success, God's able to shut it down and show that the, that the least likely people can succeed uh, in, in his plan and in his way. Let's let's talk about you, and I, I want you to tell me what what it is that uh, feeds your soul. Honestly, every day, the first thing I have to do is to spend time in the Word, to pray, um, to journal, and I've always been pretty good at those things. Um, you get busy and you slide a day or two here or there, and you don't want that to add up. But what happened for me during the pandemic is it became absolutely essential. I couldn't even turn on my phone or look at a single thing. Um, the first thing I did was to slide out of bed and get on my knees and pray and go pick up the word because everything for everybody seems so overwhelming. You would turn on the news and see how many more thousand people had been affected or had died. Hear terrible stories about families losing multiple people within days of each other. The stock markets um, were just bleeding points. People were losing their jobs. There was just so much pain and so much fear. And I realized, huh, I actually am taking comfort in so many things <laughs> that are not um, strictly the Lord. And I do think, obviously, He allows us to enjoy creation and He provides for us. But I found that a lot of my stability and security was sort of in day-to-day -day things that aren't the Lord and that were um, out of control for me. And it, and it made me root back to the one thing that is certain and sure and unchanging, which is God and his word and his promises. And he doesn't ever promise us we'll have a life of ease or of only good, fun, wonderful things, but he does promise he will walk through that with us. And that has been true in my life in the worst, worst, darkest moments for sure. But I found that the pandemic was really a rerouting into all the things that feed my soul and putting them back in first priority where they should be so that to start my day that way makes me able to face everything else that's coming, whether I know it or not. And it's often the unexpected that's the most painful or hardest. So for me, that feeds my soul, being in the word, studying, um, listening and praying and journaling. I like to get my thoughts on paper to feel like this nugget, I want to remember that. I want to be able to open this um, days, weeks, or months from now or years from now and say, that's what I was learning. That's what he was showing me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You faced some things in your life where um, it wasn't so pleasant for mm -hmm. you. Let's talk about one of those. Let's talk about um, you know when you faced uh, being told that there's no cure, for example. Let's go into the hood a little bit about that because – I know a lot of folks right now are listening to this, and, and they, in many ways, are facing something where, where they believe that uh, there's, there's no way to get through a crisis. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. that they face. Mm-hmm. How have you been able to do that? I think everybody is going to get that phone call or that message if they haven't already at some point in life that um, there's devastating news on the other end. And for me, I walked through years of a physical ailment. Um, It took me going from doctor to doctor to find finally the doctor that would help me with the chronic pain I was living with. It turns out um, what I discovered and what he was able to diagnose for me is that I have an incurable cornea disease. And what it meant at the time I got to him was that I was tearing my cornea all the time. If you've ever scratched your eye, you know, that kind of pain for me, it was almost every day. And I was getting to a very dark place a couple of years into this where I'd had no help as far as a a good diagnosis and treatment. And um, I would search online, which I never recommend that you do for your physical problems, because you'll find you have about 17 seconds left (laughs) to live. But I found message boards where I found people with similar symptoms. And I thought, okay, great. Maybe these people have a name for this. Maybe I can find diagnosis. And I would read and read about their stories about showing up at the emergency room and sort of being shuffled away. There's nothing wrong with you. We can't help you. And there were people who would be on these message boards talking about ending their lives. And I, it didn't strike me as crazy at all. I thought that sounds like sort of a relief. I mean, God knows what I'm living with every day, how I can barely get through a day at a time, a night at a time. He would understand. I mean, I really, in my brain was having these conversations. I would think about my family. I would think about even my dog, (laughs) just think um, everyone's going to be fine without me. I can't continue living like this. If this is the rest of my life um, in chronic pain with no hope in sight, it's not a life. But there was something also about those thoughts that I was having in that conversation that I was having with myself that I knew was unhealthy. And I confided in my husband because he was only the, he was the only person who really knew how difficult things had gotten for me. And I felt like I couldn't even share it with, you know, coworkers or friends, even my parents, because I had no diagnosis and I couldn't explain what was happening. And I I told him just how dark things had gotten for me. And luckily um, he was not the kind of person to shame me or say, how could you think that as a Christian or you can't take your own life? I mean, he didn't react in those ways at all. He said, we are going to find an answer. If we have to spend every dime and travel the world, we're going to find you an answer and let's pray. And we prayed that night for a doctor. And I prayed, Lord, if you're not going to heal me. And I often thought about, you know, in Corinthians, the Paul's thorn in his side, if you're not going to heal me, um, give me the strength. Your strength is enough. It's made sufficient in my weakness to get me through this, please send me someone who can help me. And through a series of events I talk about in my first book, I was led to this doctor here in DC that to me was an absolute answer to prayer. And I tell him that every time I see him and he sort of has this nervous chuckle, but I'm like, nope, you're an answer to prayer. God sent me to you, you to me. Um, And he was the first person able to tell me exactly what I had. Um, But when he said those words in his office, but you have to know there is no cure I felt like the bottom dropped out of the world again for me. Um, And it was years of his um, treatment and finally a surgery. And um, as I look out my window while I'm talking to you and I can see the leaves on the trees and I can sleep through the night without tearing my cornea. I mean, I'm just overwhelmed by gratitude. I just remember praying, crying in my car after that eye doctor appointment and feeling like the Lord said to me, um, I don't feel like I've ever audibly heard God say to me, but this was the closest thing I've had to it in my spirit, him saying, I will be with you. Not, I'm going to cure you. I'm going to take this all away. I will be with you. And he has been. Um, and there've been times when all I could pray was, Lord, please help me. Lord, please help me over and over and over again. Nothing more eloquent, um, nothing deeper spiritually or more advanced. Just Lord, please help me. And he has been there in those moments. I didn't think I could make it and through everything since then. And I'm just so grateful and, and truly through the, the toughest moments, um, I grew closer to him. I grew spiritually. It's made me more empathetic to other people who are struggling with physical ailments and chronic pain. So there were definitely benefits to that journey and it wasn't for nothing. Wow, those are powerful words. You know, years ago I went through a divorce, and then I went through a—I uh, had a stroke, and and mm. and I uh, was full of a lot of anxiety. And mm-hmm. my dad, uh, you know, he's uh, he's been a big influence on over me, and he he just said to me, he says, "Look, every time I I've run up against an obstacle in my life, I just repeat over and over again 
God will take care. God will take care. And I, mm-hmm. I remember those words. And you know how many times I've used those words over the mm-hmm. uh, over the decade. Um, I, I can't, probably endlessly, endlessly. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that. And I, I know we only have a couple more minutes. I just want to ask you, really going forward. And you know, we've come out of, of a difficult year in many ways, uh, from all the craziness, the rioting, and the all the mm-hmm. politics, and then of the, the pandemic. I mean, I, I can't remember a year in my many years on this earth that we've faced this type of thing. What is your hope going forward for the country? What is your hope for us as a people? And what is your hope for, um, you know, just uh, getting back to uh, the basics? What, mm-hmm. Tell me what your prayer for America is. Yeah. You know, I pray for our president and vice president, our judges and our lawmakers. I try to get that in every day as part of my list. Uh, I think we're called as Christians to do that, regardless of whether your party or not your party is uh, currently running things. Um, I think we should always pray for our leaders for wisdom. I pray for revival and reconciliation in our country. Um, Joel Rosenberg, who is a friend and an author I admire greatly, wrote a book years ago called Implosion about the various times in our in our country's history where it seemed we would break apart, things like the Civil War, things that were just so destructive. Um, and, and what we've been through the past year, I think we see a lot of that and, and people who are hurting about so many topics. And I think the church can be a big part of healing, I hope, against um, you know the enemy and through uh, racial divides and things that need to be addressed that are very difficult topics. I think we can be a positive force in all of that and that Christ calls us to that. Um, so I pray for revival. Um, Joel talks about that implosion in implosion about how revival has been such a critical point in healing the country when we've been so divided and mistrusting our neighbors and, um, you know, immediately shutting down people that we may not agree with, uh, instead of seeing each other as what we are, which are humans created in the image of God. He loves every person, even your worst enemy and my worst enemy. Um, they are created in his image and he is all about redeeming them and bringing them, um, to him. And so we have a role to do every day in that individually as Christians, uh, and I pray for our country, which has been a great force for good. We have made um, bad decisions and terrible mistakes. Um, but I think overall, um, if we are surrendered to God and his purpose, which is, you know, love him with our heart, mind, and soul and love our neighbors as ourself, that's a big calling. And I think it would solve a lot of problems if we could view um, our fellow travelers that way. I, I hope that one of the things that sticks around is that we do reach out to other people. I found that to happen a lot during COVID. Um, neighbors who are dropping off baked goods or checking on each other, offering to run errands and look out for each other. And I've got a very diverse neighborhood. Um, ideologically, people are all over the place. They know where I work. And I think um, it's been wonderful for us all to reach out and take care of each other. And I said, I, I feel like that's actually being hands and feet, um, which I think we all need to do. Well, Shannon's book is called The Women of the Bible Speak, The Wisdom of 16 Women and Their Lessons for Today. Shannon, thank you so much. You've been a wonderful guest, and uh, we really appreciate you and, and continue to keep the faith, and we wish you much continued success and health. God bless you, David. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. And, uh, you let, too. Let's have a great year, okay? <laughs> let's do it. Okay. I'm with you. All righty. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wasn't she just delightful? You know, she just brightened up my day, I'll tell you. There's some folks on here that uh, they're good guests, and then there's some that just, uh, you know, I walk out of the studio and I go, well, that was fun. You know, I, I got something out of that myself. I, I feel I feel better than I did 30 minutes or an hour ago. And Speaking to Shannon, uh, she was just one of those people. So definitely pick up uh, her book. It's called The Women of the Bible Speak, The Wisdom of 16 Women and Their Lessons for Today by Shannon Bream. Available now on Amazon or wherever you get your books. And I know 90% of us get our books on Amazon, but um, you know maybe you still go to a bookstore. You know, there are some that remain out there. I know Barnes & Noble, although Barnes & Noble, I don't know as much of a bookstore. It's more of a toy store now. But uh, still, you know, I was in Barnes & Noble the other day, and I'm like, man, they still have a huge magazine section. I mean, 
And some of these magazines are like $13, $14, $15. I mean, really? Seriously? You know, I'd say the majority are, what, four or five bucks. But I'm like, wow, who pays? I mean, I, I used to love books. I, I still love books, but I used to love magazines. And I'd go on a trip and, and uh, I'd, you know, I'd go through the airport and I'd buy five or six magazines just to get me through the uh, the ride on the on the plane. You know, I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to be bored for the next three, four hours. I can't do Internet. Sometimes when you do have Internet, it doesn't work. And, you know, yeah, I got a little work to do. But, you know, I, I, I want to chill out a little bit. So I'll buy three or four magazines. And before you know it, you spent 25 bucks on magazines. And those days are kind of gone because now you have all this stuff in your phone. You use Internet access. access and then, of course, uh, when you don't have access, you can download things on your phone or your tablet or iPad. So, uh, But I was in Barnes & Noble the other day, and they had this huge huge magazine section i'm like seriously people still buy magazines so i don't know i'm not picking on those of you who buy magazines I've, I've always loved magazines but it seems like everything is available to us now online so you really wonder how they're still making money i don't know well all the power to them i'm glad they're keeping some folks employed but uh, yeah, d definitely check out shannon's book it's really really cool and she's really cool and i really appreciate it her being my guest today here on uh, Contagious Influencers of America. Listen, we love you guys. We love your feedback. We love it when you take the time to rate us and to review us and to uh, give us five-star ratings. That's really cool. And we love those of you who reach out to iHeartRadio and say, man, I love CIA Contagious Influencers of America because we're one of the top podcasts on iHeartRadio's podcast platforms in the spirituality section, and that is really super, super neat when that happens. So thank you all for uh, listening to us on iHeartRadio's podcast platform. You can get the app, download it now, and you can get all your podcasts there. And of course, I know a lot of you get your podcasts from other places, but uh, and you can find us anywhere but uh, i just wanted to give a special shout out to the folks at iheart and for those of you who uh, actually download our podcast there we really appreciate you this has been cia contagious influencers of america from the producers of keep the faith radio the number one faith-based radio show in all of america i'm david sams and i really really uh have enjoyed this i've enjoyed uh, camping out with you here i'm on an airplane tomorrow first time i've been on an airplane for over a year i'm heading down to uh florida and we're going to do a few meetings and i'm going to go to a couple of uh spring training games and that's going to be really a lot of fun as we uh come out of the dark and into the light and get on with our lives here in 2021. Hey, go out there and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living it in black and white. I'm David Sams. I'll see you next time here on CIA Contagious Influencers of America. <laughs>